Some people have written about um, natural capital, the capital that nature provides, which is the clean air, the clean water, the, the uncut forests, the, the rich farmland, um, and the minerals, the oil, the, the metals, all of these things are the capital that nature has provided. And until about 1980, human civilization was able to live on what we might term the interest of that capital, the surplus that nature is able to produce, uh, the food that farmland can grow without actually degrading the farmland, or the number of fish you can pull out of the sea without causing the fish stocks to, stocks to, to crash. But since 1980, we've been using more than the interest. And so we are, in effect, like somebody who thinks he's rich because he's spending the money that has been left in his inheritance. Uh, not spending the interest, but eating into the capital. The last time I visited the New York Stock Exchange was in 1980, and the mood sure was different then. Government, with its high taxes, excessive spending, and overregulation, had thrown a wrench in the works of our free markets. With tax reform and budget control, our economy will be free to expand to its full potential, driving the bears back into permanent hibernation. That's our economic program for the next four years. We're going to turn the bull loose. The economists say, if you clear cut the forest, take the money, and put it in the bank, you can make six or seven percent. If you clear cut the forest, put it into Malaysia or Papua New Guinea, you can make 30 or 40 percent. So who cares whether you keep the forest? Cut it down, put the money somewhere else. When those forests are gone, put it in fish. When the fish are gone, put it in computers. Money doesn't stand for anything, and money now grows faster than the real world. Conventional economics is a form of brain damage. If you take a, an introductory course in economics, the professor in the first lecture will show a slide of the economy. And it looks very impressive, you know, raw materials, extraction, process, manufacture, wholesale, retail, with arrows going back and forth. And they try to impress you because they think, they, they know damn well, economics is not a science, but they're trying to fool us into thinking that it's a real science. It's not. Economics is a set of values that they then try to use mathematical equations and all that stuff and pretend that it's a science. But if you ask the economist, in that equation, where do you put the ozone layer? Where do you put the deep underground aquifers of fossil water? Where do you put topsoil or biodiversity? Their answer is, oh, those are externalities. Well, then you might as well be on Mars. That economy is not based in anything like the real world. It's life, the web of life that filters water in the hydrologic cycle. It's microorganisms in the soil that create the soil that we can grow our food in. Nature performs all kinds of services. Insects fertilize all of the flowering plants. These services are vital to the health of the planet. Economists call these externalities. That's nuts. The Ice Age hunter is still us. It's still in us. Uh, those ancient hunters who thought that there would always be another herd of mammoth over the next hill shared the optimism of the stock trader that there's always going to be another big killing on the stock market in the next week or two. Get your bets now, ladies and gentlemen. And our economy seemingly on the brink of collapse. Globally, the moment and while banks have failed and shares have plummeted, the effects are working their way down to all of us. Will the economy turn around? Yes. I'm not an economist, but I do believe that we're growing, and uh, I can remember, you know, this press conference here, every people. Yelling recession this, recession that, as if you're economists. And uh, I'm an optimist. You know, I, I believe there's a lot of positive things for our economy. Well, the, the term uh, oligarchy obviously sounds a little, a little esoteric. It just means a small group of people have got a lot of political power based on their economic power. We like to think of the United States as being much more democratic, much more spread out in terms of who has the power, 
And, and oligarchy is something that's usually associated with relatively poor countries, but that view has to be updated because we've got an essential part of, of that problem, that structure, in the United States today. The people who got all this economic power were in the financial sector. It was Wall Street, if, if I can you know, use that, that, that shorthand expression. Wall Street became really powerful. They used that power to buy influence in, in Washington, get uh, more deregulation, so to get more of the playing field uh, shaped in the way they wanted, which was no government intervention, no restrictions on what they were going to do. That enabled them to make a lot more money, which brought them more political power. And this went on for a considerable period of time until, of course, there was an enormous crash. But basically, you come to us today on your bicycles after buying Girl Scout cookies and helping out Mother Teresa, telling us we're sorry, we didn't mean it, we won't do it again, trust us. Well, I have some people in my constituency that actually robbed some of your banks, and they say the same thing. They're sorry, they didn't mean it, they won't do it again, just let them out. Do you understand that this is a little difficult for most of my constituents to take? That you learned your lesson? The bankers can't stop themselves. It's in their DNA, in the DNA of their organizations, to take massive risks, to pay themselves ridiculous salaries, and, and to collapse. And the, the more that reasonable, responsible people of the center, and the left and the right, see this, the closer we'll get to finally constraining the power of, of these uh, out of control financial oligarchs. Well, my job on Wall Street was to be balance and payments economist for the Chase Manhattan Bank in the 1960s. My first job there was to calculate how much debt could uh, third world countries pay. And the answer was, well, how much do they earn? And whatever they earn, that's what they can afford to pay in interest. And our objective was to take the entire earnings of a third world country and say, ideally, that would be all paid as interest to us. You can relate the destruction of the rainforest in Brazil directly to the uh, Wall Street and London uh, financial sector. Uh, it, the story begins in 1982 when countries couldn't pay their debt anymore. And the result is that the Latin American countries generally stopped paying because they said, we're already paying all of the balance of payments surplus we have uh, to the banks. We don't have any money to import to sustain living standards. We don't have money to import to build new factories and to pay the debt. So the International Monetary Fund at that point said, don't go bankrupt, you have an option. You can begin to sell off the public domain. You have plenty of assets to sell to pay us. You can sell off your water rights, your forests, your subsoil mineral resources. You can sell us your oil rights. And so uh, Brazil, Argentina, and other countries begin to sell off uh, their resources to private investors. And the private investors bought these resources on credit. Look, don't give me a hard luck story. I hear them every day, and quite frankly, they bore me. The facts are simple. In 1973, this bank gave you a loan, and you still haven't paid it back. Admittedly, you paid back the initial sum, but not the interest, which to date amounts to nine times the amount originally borrowed nine times so you better get your act together times are tough and we're all having to clamp down and don't look at me like that this is a bank not a charity <laughs> 